little nauseous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Deborah McGregor here and uh, Oni Bojo. So welcome to the second of our speakers for our um, speaker series for Indigenous History Month. So uh, the approach that we've taken to looking at Indigenous History Month is we're just really wanting people to just kind of learn about or with actually ideally with Indigenous peoples. Um, and if we're learning a lot of um, history at the same time, that's great. But part of the, the approach too that we took to this was that history isn't just like totally in the past. There's a lot that's really relevant to understanding contemporary Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations or relations with whomever happens to be um, in the area uh, that we're in right now. Um, and right now it just so happens that I'm in Toronto and so is our guest, uh, Professor John Johnson today. So we're trying to just um, raise awareness and use these opportunities. And I'm just really thrilled that people have agreed to be, uh, to be part of this as I bumble my way through all the technology. Um, so um, what I wanted to do was um, just talk a little bit about John's work. So he'll be talking about his research. You can just find his bio really quickly, John Johnson, University of Toronto, and he'll come up, really cool research. But I, I wanted to say that I use a lot of his work. He's actually um, led one of my classes through a High Park uh, tour before. Because um, one of the things I do when I, uh, when I teach is I try to ground students in the place that they're in. Um, what does it mean to be um, in, in Toronto? Who are the indigenous people here? Hey, you know what, they're still here. They're still doing stuff. Um, and that there's this oftentimes in invisible history and part of what John's doing is trying to make that invisibility actually quite visible. Um, so I, I really engage and really appreciate the work that John's doing, especially with the First Story app. Um, and it's again, uh, again, part of my courses. And, and if you're really interested in that, we can um, share the, the link with you. Um, I also thought it was is really important because understanding the history of Toronto is something that you can um, you can do while still respecting COVID nineteen physical distancing. You can you can go on your own. You don't have to go to a lecture somewhere at York, U T, Ryerson, or any of the colleges. You can actually um, you can do this uh, you can do this on your own. So. Um, so to me, I see it also in a part of um, environmental history and Indigenous history. So um, with that, I just want to hand it over to John, and I'm just really grateful he was here and, and hope you enjoy his work uh, and find it as uh, valuable as I do in the work that I've been doing. So um, take it away, John. And again, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for coming and, and sharing with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction. It's always nice to hear when people uh, uh, enjoy what you're doing or respect what you're doing. So that's that's nice. I appreciate that. So I'm just going to load up my uh, my presentation here. Okay, hopefully that's uh, visible to everyone. So um, very much in keeping with uh, what uh, Deb was saying about histories um, is thinking about these indigenous histories, not as, as in the past, but as uh, contemporary uh, and uh, as future oriented as well. So uh, the title of my talk today is on uh, Indigenous Geographies in Toronto. So urban Indigenous Geographies in this place that we call Toronto, Toronto. Um, it's a very, very long history and it's a history that's unfolding in the present. Um, and uh, these stories are, are really contributing to an alternative uh, vision or understanding of Toronto that's becoming increasingly resonant uh, in the city. Um, and I in really important ways, and it's, it's activating different possibilities in the present. So I, I really enjoy sharing these stories because I feel like um, people find them important and um, they're doing things in the city. Um, and of course, these are, this is just, I'll also start by saying that these are just my versions of these 
larger stories. Um, they're just individual tellings. And there are many, many other versions out there. So uh, there's a lot of people doing amazing work uh, in Toronto, uh, a lot of Indigenous people doing amazing work around Indigenous geographies. So if you're interested in this, uh, definitely uh, look into some of the other people who are doing some amazing stuff. So um, I've kind of oriented my presentation around a map in keeping with the geography's theme, uh, a map of Toronto. I've, I've taken away largely the, the streets, uh, try to kind of uh, dial back the overdetermined space uh, of the contemporary city and the grid pattern to reveal uh, the landforms, the rivers, the geography, um, the lake shores, and things like that. Um, sometimes I like to identify where we are on the map, but uh, that's not possible because uh, we're all over the place right now. Uh, I'm currently uh, speaking from Curtis, Ontario, <laughs> where I live. Um, all right, so this is a history that these stories go back to the last ice age, if not before. You know, there are there are there's a history in Toronto that goes back to that to that time when the glaciers were were just starting to recede. Um, of course, the stories go back even before that. You know, indigenous understandings of uh, their origins on this continent go back before the last ice age, and there are stories of of um, of. Uh, uh, creation and then you know the 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 oncoming of never-ending winters and then the thaws and the floods that come in the aftermath of that all of these things could be uh, ice age memories of you know uh, past geographies uh, what I have on the slide here uh, uh, is a is a snapshot of a mural uh, used by permission uh, from uh, indigenous artist Philip Cote um, this is a really interesting mural, uh, part one mural of a series that Philip painted in the Humber River near Old Mill Station, just underneath the bridge. So if you want to see these uh, in, their, uh, in their glory, you should definitely check that out as part of your uh, physical distancing field trips. Um, so if you go under the, um, the, uh, the TTC uh, rail bridge, you'll see that uh, the supports have been painted with these amazing story murals. Um, depicting creation, different aspects of creation in that Anishinaabe creation story. Um, but this mural is really, uh, I really appreciate this particular mural because it speaks to that time of, of an ice age and the long presence of indigeneity, uh, indigenous presence in Toronto. So I'm not, Philip paints in the woodland style. To me, I think this might be the only representation I've ever seen, uh, woodland representation of ice age fauna, like the, uh, the mammoth and the, the, the cave bear the, the short-nosed bear and other Ice Age megafauna. Uh, but the mural talks about, uh, in, in Philip's telling, uh, the Ogoming and Ninawag, which are the ice runners, the people who were here at the time of that glacier and, and would uh, hunt along the edge of the glacier. So there are teachings um, that, that are shared within communities that Philip is involved with that, um, that share these stories of these Ice Age peoples. And of course, uh, you know, there are other, um, there's other evidence of indigenous presence going back well back, you know, thousands and thousands of years, right back to the to the last ice age, including the time in the aftermath of the ice age about 10,000 years ago when when the uh, the lakeshore was actually further to the south than it is today. I'm not going to go into the geographical or the geological mechanics of it, but it's it's isostatic rebound. It's basically uh, 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 the land moves in ways that the um, in the aftermath of glaciation, whereby the lakeshore was was further to the south. And so what is now Toronto Harbor, part of that was revealed as land about 10,000 years ago. And there's a story about these um, workers uh, back in 1907, I believe it was, and they were installing pipeline in the bottom of the Toronto Harbor uh, for drinking water. And uh, they were right at the, they were right at the bottom of the lake and uh, the workers came across these footprints in the clay. And they were uh, a series of moccasin footprints going sort of from uh, the Western uh, part of the city towards the what is now downtown Toronto and there was a child's footprints and uh, several others and they were kind of uh, all walking in that direction um, they were on a tight schedule those workers so they they basically just paved over the footprints but one of them managed to take a quick sketch of the footprints as they appeared in the clay uh, at that time and you, so you can see pictures of that kind of low res and grainy but you can still see pictures of that sketch but this would have um, these would be some of the oldest footprints to be uncovered in Turtle Island, North America, uh, if they weren't destroyed. I mean, part of me thinks that maybe uh, these footprints are still surviving in the bottom of the lakeshore in a sort of a, a concrete cast, but uh, I guess we can't be sure of that. 
but they were there. So those uh, those ancient uh, post glacial peoples, uh, you know, they are the ancestors of the contemporary people that we know as the Wendat, uh, who are part of the larger Wend. You know, there was a Wendat confederacy, so there's at least four nations, as far as I know, that are part of that confederacy, as well as the Seneca, who were part of uh, you know who have stories in this land as well, who are also part of the Haudenosaunee. Confederacy, the Six Nations, and uh, also the Mississaugas, who are part of the larger uh, Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. Each of these peoples um, have lived in Toronto and continue to live in Toronto, uh, but were historically present in Toronto at the time of the coming of the first Europeans. When first Europeans started coming, uh, they were French explorers in the 1600s. Wendat, uh, the Wendat were understood this to be their territory. Um, and it was Wendat guides that showed some of the early French explorers through the area of Toronto. Uh, the Seneca were here uh, in the uh, 1650s to the end of the 1600s, and the Mississaugas uh, were back, back in the area um, and uh, established villages in this area after that, after the 17, in the early 1700s. But there are stories that talk about how the Mississaugas uh, and the ancestors of the Mississaugas understood that the Great Lakes in this area uh, were part of their ancestral lands going back for thousands of years. Uh, so they understand, uh, you know, some, some Anishinaabe people understand this territory of Toronto to be Anishinaabe territory going back uh, thousands and thousands of years. So there's different stories about that. Uh, but we do know, of course, that all of these peoples understand Toronto as within their traditional territories. And um, there are names all across the, the landscape uh, that despite uh, hundreds of years, a couple hundred years of colonialism and concerted attempts at erasure of indigenous narratives, indigenous geographies and indigenous, uh, you know, um, relationships with land, that there are many names that still are, uh, are resonant and still visible in the landscape of Toronto that come from each of these peoples, including uh, Lake Ontario, which um, there are different pronunciations of this, but um, there's a root word from within um, Haudenosaunee languages, Onidario, or maybe perhaps Scania Dario, which you can hear Ontario in, in an anglicized form, but it basically means um, beautiful lake or good looking waters. <clears throat> and of course, that's also the namesake of the whole province of Ontario. Um, Minising, that's an Anishinaabe Moan term that refers to Toronto Islands. I think it basically means island or on the island, but it, uh, it's a named place that, that shows or suggests strongly that um, the islands were a really important place for the Mississaugas. And they were, they were understood to be a ceremonial place, a place of healing, place of ceremony. And they still are today, even when the Mississaugas were uh, being pushed off of uh, their lands in the aftermath of the signing of the Toronto Purchase in 1787, whenever they would come back into the city, uh, into the downtown areas, into the emerging colony of uh, York, they would always stay on the island. Back then it was a peninsula. It was still connected to the, to the mainland by a thin strip of sand. And they would always camp out there. So they understood that to be, even in, in the aftermath of the treaty, their place. And it was an important place for healing. And it still is today. The ceremony still happens on the island. Uh, Widupkog, um, again, I'm not totally sure on my pronunciation of this, so take that with a huge grain of salt, but uh, an Anishinaabemowin word that refers to a place of black alders. Um, and it survives in the anglicized name of Etobicoke today. Uh, so the city of Etobicoke is an anglicized Anishinaabemowin term that refers to black alders, which probably again describes the predominant trees in that area, or at least an area where there were a lot of black alders. That's the thing about a lot of indigenous place names. Um, they're not really named so much after people <laughs> in the way that Europeans do in their tradition. They're named after places or uh, they're named after lands. They describe lands or they describe how the lands were used by the people. So there's a lot of important information that comes out of a lot of these, uh, these names. That's why they're so important and resonant today. Um, Mimiko uh, or uh, Omimika in Anishinaabemowin refers to a place of wild pigeons where wild pigeons grow. And this is a place, Mimico was a hunting ground for, um, for Anishinaabe peoples, probably many other peoples as well, going back historically. Um, but thousands and thousands of pigeons, wild pigeons, which are now extinct, were uh, recorded as being in this place. This was like a roosting area for them. And there are descriptions, historical descriptions of 
there's being so many of these pigeons in places like Mimico that when they took flight, it would be like thunder in the sky and, and the sky would go dark uh, with the, the flapping of the wings in the skies. Um, I'm doing some work on, on sort of trying to reconstruct or, or think through um, these histories and these landscapes and trying to connect sort of fragmentary pieces together. And I'll talk about it a little later, but one of the things I've been looking at is um, the presence of savannas in places like Toronto as well, and the connection to Indigenous peoples and Indigenous land stewardship efforts. And uh, I know, of course, and many of you probably also know that there is there is still a remaining uh, Black Oak savanna in parts of High Park, but the original savanna was huge. And Black Oaks, of course, are known for releasing acorns. And acorns are one of the main food sources of these wild pigeons. So it makes sense that Mimico Omimica, this place of wild pigeons was right next to uh, what is now High Park, where there were a vast store of uh, acorns, not only for the people, but for these wild pigeons. <clears throat> Mississauga, of course, being named after the, the Mississauga peoples, the Mississauga nation, um, different interpretations of what that means, um, but I tend to favor um, the ones that um, have been put forward by the Mississaugas themselves. Uh, Doug Williams, for instance, says that uh, Mississauga refers to um, the people who lived at the river mouths, the, the, the people who lived at the mouths of the rivers. And that's, uh, that's an important, uh, that's an interesting definition, of course. It's an accurate definition because that's where a lot of Mississauga villages, at least in the Toronto area that I know of, were located, where they were located along the mouths of the rivers. There was an important village in uh, Miss what is now Mississauga at the mouth of the Credit River up until around 1750s. Um, that was an important trading place for the Mississaugas in the early fur trade in the area. There was also a really uh, big Mississauga village located at the mouth of the Humber River, uh, but is now destroyed. It was destroyed by the construction of the uh, Humber treatment plant. Um, so there's lots of villages that were at the mouths of the rivers. Ishpadina refers to, um, you know, the, the, the hill, it means, uh, the hill, right, going up the hill, and it refers to uh, the place on the map where um, that line ends, uh, which is Davenport Bluff, uh, uh, and that's the original shoreline of Lake Ontario 13,000 years ago in the aftermath of the last ice age. All of that up until that point was water, and um, up uh, north of that was land, so that bluff is an ancient shoreline, and that uh, word Ishpadina refers to that bluff. Of course, it survives in the contemporary anglicized word Spadina, uh, but of course it's an Anishinaabemowin origin. And uh, it's again, an important place. That bluff was, uh, I, like I said, originally the shoreline, but when the, when the waters receded to their historic levels, to their to more or less their contemporary levels, the bluff was revealed as this really large hill in the landscape. It was a prominent geographical feature. And um, we're not exactly sure when, but so at some point, perhaps a millennia ago, um, a, a, a footpath was established along that bluff and uh, it facilitated indigenous movements through this area east-west for, for, for as long as anyone can know. And it was certainly was on the earliest maps that Europeans were drawing of the area. Um, not always, but uh, wherever there were, were roadways recorded, you can see Davenport Road as a trail. And so eventually it became used by Europeans and, and eventually paved it over. Um, but it still follows the bluff. It's a contemporary street, but it still follows the bluff, uh, defying the Cartesian logic of most of the rest of the city. Because, you know, like uh, the indigenous path that it recalls, it follows the land. It doesn't follow the, the Cartesian logic. Yeah. So you can see that's Davenport uh, Road there, roughly, <laughs> in that red line. And uh, the path continued beyond Davenport Road. It went all the way across uh, north, the North Shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, so the exact pathways are still kind of sketchy um, where these paths went. But to the east, it, it went along uh, the edge of Rosedale Valley Ravine and then across the Don River, where there was wild rice recorded as growing, uh, which of course is an important food for Anishinaabe peoples, uh, the Mississaugas. Um, so wild rice was growing there, so you know that was a place that was utilized for gathering by Mississauga peoples. Probably the growth of that wild rice was fostered by Indigenous peoples. And then uh, going eastward, it follows Kingston Road and uh, Danforth Road and other places like that. So a lot of these contemporary roads are, 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 are informed by the previous Indigenous paths. To the west, 
it kind of uh, goes, there's two paths. One goes along the north, one goes along what is now Dundas Street, um, all the way through Mississauga uh, towards Hamilton and around the lake. And the other one follows more the lake shore and it goes through the hunting ground of Mimico or Mimica and other places like that. So there was a lakeshore route, as far as I can tell, as well as Dundas Street. And then these paths were cross-sected uh, by other paths, uh, equally important, perhaps maybe even more so, uh, more important, going to the north, uh, going to the north and, and you know, connecting the north-south. So one of the most important paths was along uh, the Humber, what is now known as the Humber River which Anishinaabe people um, had named uh, Kebejino, which means, um, some people say like, um, it means leave the canoes and go back, which I, I kind of like that because it kind of talks about how this route was a portage, which of course it was. Uh, it wasn't a predominantly a canoeing route because the waters wouldn't allow that, but it was a walking route. So a portage between two lakes. Uh, but other people who are more fluent in Anishinaabe Moan than I have said that it kind of probably refers more to an overnight camping spot, which also makes sense because, you know, uh, going through these routes east-west, you know, you might stop along this route before going, uh, switching north-south, um, and you might camp at that intersection. So Kebejinong was one. Uh, one of the arms would becomes known as the Toronto Carrying Place Trail. Another east, another north-south route went along what is now the Rouge River, but which was named by Anishinaabe peoples as Chisipi or, or Big River or Big Stream or Big Creek, uh, also connecting up to Lake Simcoe there. And the third route, which was the least well-known uh, of the three routes, uh, was went along roughly what is now the Don River watershed. Um, and the Don River has two names, but one of them I'll share now, um, uh, which is Nishin Um Again, pronunciation is difficult because this is a word that um, has been heavily translated through you know uh, English dialects and, and people who probably could not render Anishinaabe Moan well uh, in their own language. Um, so people are still trying to reconstruct what this word exactly could mean, but I've, I've had different translations. The one I like the most is is perhaps uh, that it means a place that is a good place for pines because you can see Nishingakokam, it's a, Nishingwak, Shingwak is a good good pine maybe. Um, that sort of connects to the, the geography of the area, which I'll talk to, I'll speak to a little later. But that was the third route that went up. And they all connected together to form one major route that would take you up into Northern Ontario. So it became, these routes facilitated huge amounts of traffic from Northern Ontario into the Northern United States. And the majority of the trade was going north, south through these areas and brought people into the Toronto area for millennia. And it was a very diverse place historically. Um, Going back as far as anyone can know, uh, certainly uh, at least 2000 years ago, this place was a really, really a prominent, being prominently used as a trade road. There was lots of trading going on through these areas, maybe even before that. Um, so these routes sort of talk about that. And that's why Toronto ends up becoming really important when Europeans arrive in the early fur trade and uh, ends up becoming a strategically important place for the establishment of European settlements as it is across the entire country. Most of the places where you see uh, prominent Canadian cities, you know, all of those places were first indigenous settlements that were important and they were settled as European col colonies or, or, or settlements simply, simply because indigenous peoples had already established them as important places. Um, Toronto is no different. So that's where that word Toronto comes from is um, uh, along these routes because up along these routes, um, there was um, a fishing weir right at the north uh, tip there of Lake Simcoe, right where it meets another lake called Lake Kuchiching. Uh, there was a fishing weir that was located there, a very important, prominent fishing weir, uh, regional to this place. And it was certainly used by the Wendat and after by Anishinaabe peoples in the Mississaugas, probably I imagine by Haudenosaunee as well, but I haven't uh, seen that yet. Um, but uh, uh, Toronto is understood either to be um, a Wendat word or a Haudenosaunee word. Um, the exact origin is still being debated because of course the languages are, are close and um, with anglicization it becomes difficult to trace the exact origin of some of these words but it certainly is a sort of an Iroquoian word that refers to most likely where trees are standing in the water so it describes these fishing weirs which are depicted in the, in the photographs there where trees are, where these posts stick into the water and they become important places for trapping fish. So they're important gathering places. Um, 
And because you would often fish in places like this for a season, they also became important meeting places, uh, places where you would know you could meet people who were fishing, who were using the weirs. So this place at, uh, uh, at the fishing weir, which Anishinaabe people now call Majikining, and it's their word, you know, Anishinaabe Moan for fishing weir, uh, became also important really gathering places and meeting places to not only fish and gather and, and things like that, but also to, you know, to, to talk about political matters and to trade. And it was being used that way up until the 1800s before uh, the Anishinaabe peoples again were being pushed off of the lands by encroaching European settlement in the aftermath of the signing of treaties and stuff. But uh, they, they took divers down uh, back in the 20th century, I think it was like the 70s or the 80s or something like that to see if they could still find the remnants of this weir and they found them they were still there um and they're still there today and uh, those divers they took some pieces of the um, of the fishing weir and they radiocarbon dated them and they came back with dates of 5,000 years which means that these uh fishing weirs were probably being used continuously for 5,000 years up until the 1800s um so when we talk about indigenous relationships to land we're often talking about a vision of engagement uh, and land-based relationality uh, that could be millennia in the making. So that's the level of connection on which many Indigenous peoples are uh, understand their connection to the land to be. Um, so that word Toronto or Toronto probably got uh, translated down to the North Shore of Lake Ontario because of the roots that connected them all together, right? Um, another area of my research that I'm kind of looking at um, is the connection between places where indigenous peoples lived and traveled uh, and the uh, and, and, and savannas. And savannas are, be, are these uh, really interesting ecosystems in Ontario, in Southern Ontario in particular, because um, they're not for the most part what I would call natural ecosystems in the sense that, you know, most of what is now Southern Ontario doesn't really want to be a savanna. Uh, they're only savannas, um, the savannas savanna only exist there because of usually they're renewed through fire. Um, they could be natural fires or they could be controlled, you know, human caused fires. Um, and uh, so savannas are interesting. So they're kind of like, if you can imagine, not a forest, not a prairie, but somewhere in between. So lots of grassland, lots of open areas uh, with a few trees, uh, old growth trees here and there to provide shade and mixed shade environments. So they're really diverse environments. They, they, they carry a lot, these savannas. Um, and a lot of species that you wouldn't necessarily see in closed forests or forests or in open prairies. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, Indigenous peoples were attracted uh, and continue to be attracted to these places is because of the diversity, the biodiversity that they offer and things that you wouldn't necessarily get in other environments. So I'm kind of, I've, I've, I have been looking at sort of the use of controlled burns, which was a practice common across all of Turtle Island as far as I can tell. Uh, to maintain open areas uh, like these savannas. And so if you, if you map where the savannas are in Ontario and you put that over top of a map of the trail systems, indigenous trail systems in Southern Ontario, as I've done here, you can kind of see that there's a very close relationship between where savannas are and where the trails are. And, and of course that's no accident. So it's because indigenous peoples were investing in time and energy and resources in controlled burns within their territories along these paths to open them up to, to create, um, you know, these these grounds, which were important medicine grounds. They were important hunting grounds. They attracted lots of deer, um, as well as, um, like I said, medicines and other plants you wouldn't get elsewhere. So, and High Park is one of those uh, savannas. So you can see here, I've kind of mapped out the savannas in Toronto, uh, from what I can tell so far. Uh, there are, these are the three big ones. There's also one that's not on this map in uh, uh, what is now Rouge Park. So Rouge Park probably was the biggest savanna. So pretty much all of what is now Rouge Park was at one point uh, a savanna, a pine savanna, as well as the one at the beaches uh, to the west, or sorry, to the east here. That was a pine savanna. Probably also I understand the one that's along the Don River route here. Um, that was a, a pine savanna as well, which probably is one of the reasons why I kind of like the uh, translation of Nishin Gokokamek as a good place for pines, because certainly there were a lot of pines growing along the, the Don River because there were pine savannas that were created by indigenous people. So that would have been resonant for the people who named these lands. 
Uh, but one of the biggest uh, savannas in Toronto is the High Park Savannah. So you can see pictures of what it looks like at different parts of the you know spring, summer, fall season in High Park. Uh, very rich, uh, diverse area. So it was um, really, really important hunting ground, High Park, and these savannas generally were high, uh, important hunting grounds. I wanted to also point out that um, this is not an historic phenomenon either, because you know, even though Mississaugas in the aftermath of the signing of the treaties were pushed out of Toronto, you know, with the reconstitution of the Indigenous community since the 1930s in what is now known as Toronto, um, a lot of Indigenous peoples who ne wouldn't necessarily always have a lot of uh, resources would make up for shortages by hunting in lands like High Park, um, which of course was not uh, officially permitted. So a lot of that hunting was done on the sly, but there's a lot of um, stories that I've heard from community members whose relatives or maybe they themselves have stories where they, you know, would go goose hunting in Hyde Park, um, you know, to help supplement, you know, diet. Uh, so it still is an important hunting ground uh, and has been uh, for a long time. And Indigenous people still harvest medicine and engage with these lands however fragmentary they are uh, now in High Park um, as Indigenous territories. And I'll return to that later. I just wanted to also point out, I put up a little label here uh, in the center of the map, uh, Mashkote. And that's another word that's still resonant on the map of Toronto. Uh, there's a Mashkote Creek, I believe, but that um, is an Anishinaabemowin word that refers to prairie or meadow, an open area in the woods. Um, so, it survives today as Mashkote Creek, but also kind of in the description of uh, the contemporary neighborhood of Deer Park, because Deer Park describes a, a landscape where there were lots of deer. Um, and that, that's the place where, of course, deer would continue to come even in, after European settlement was encroaching on these lands and turning them into something else. The deer still would come to this area. Maybe they remembered it in their own uh, memory as a, an important place for them as well. Uh, but there are lots of stories about how these savannas facilitated huge numbers of, de of deer uh, in these area, in the area of Toronto historically. So uh, Deer Park kind of recalls the fact that this area was a savanna. That brings me to the second name for the Don River, uh, which looks there like one Skontanash or something like that. Uh, again, I think it's heavily anglicized. Uh, I'm trying to get a better pronunciation for this word. Um, maybe it's something along the lines of Wazashkodeneash or something like that, but it um, refers to a place that's been burnt, a, a, a place swept by fire. And of course, that totally recalls the fact that that's what, what this land was, it was a place that was periodically burnt to maintain savannas, both along the beaches and along uh, the, the contemporary neighborhoods of Rosedale and Deer Park. So, um, of course, I've been alluding to this, I have mentioned it a few times already, but Indigenous peoples uh, were pushed out of the Toronto areas in the aftermath of the signing of the treaties. Uh, 1787 Toronto Purchase, uh, I think the understanding was that the Mississaugas could continue to hunt and gather and fish along the lands that they were, you know, so-called uh, surrendering. Uh, but the ways the Europeans um, interpreted the treaty and the aftermath of the signing was that uh, all of the lands could be, were basically um, settlers' lands. And uh, they harassed the Mississaugas when they continued to try to hunt in these lands and fish in these lands. So slowly but surely, the Mississaugas were being pushed to the west, pushed to the east, to the north, out of these lands. Um, in the aftermath of that tr treaty, um, but of course, there was never a complete erasure of Indigenous presence in Toronto. There were always families that existed in, in Toronto that lived and, and uh, trapped along uh, the, uh, like the Don River, hunted in places like High Park. And since the 1930s, like I said, the, the Indigenous community of Toronto reurbanized and um, there was uh, a lot more engagement since that time. So now we have a very strong uh, resilient and growing urban Indigenous community of Toronto that some people estimate is as high as 200,000 people, uh, all of, you know, many of whom are doing amazing work, uh, all of whom are, 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 are residents in, in the city, uh, like I said, doing amazing work. Uh, sorry, I was just distracted because I think I was trying to check to see if there was any questions at this point, but um, 
I can't kind of see if there are any. So I'll continue and maybe, oh. Well, the question um, was uh, for the route. So there's talk oh. about changing the name of Dundas Street. Yeah. Like, is there some <laughs> sort of maybe Anishinaabek or Haudenosaunee or Wendat logic to maybe an uh, Anishinaabe name or a different yeah. kind of name? Well, yes, absolutely. Thank you. That's a great question. And it's something that I'm, I was planning on addressing my presentation anyway. So this is, this is great. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, these, there's a lot of talk, especially in the aftermath of, you know, um, you know, the increasing acknowledgement and awareness and action around anti-Black racism of, you know, streets like Russell, Dundas, uh, Jarvis, who are named after, you know, like slave owners. Um, and questions are arising about, you know, how do we want to, do we want to acknowledge these people? Or do we want to honor people who are, you know, slave owners uh, in the contemporary geography of the city? And I think a lot of people are saying, well, maybe not. And uh, Dundas is one of those streets that uh, is, 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 it's good to see that there's a conversation around this renaming. And, and, and of course, when you're thinking about other names, these other geographies come into play. So, you know, uh, this idea of indigenous, an indigenous history and indigenous geography of Toronto uh, is informing a lot of those discussions. Like if not Jarvis, if not Dundas, if not Russell, if not Young, then what? And so a lot of people are thinking about the, these indigenous histories, these indigenous geographies. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's many, you know, these stories are kind of uh, feeding into discussions about possible other names. Um, to me, you know, Dundas, uh, it's a, it's part of this trail system, you know, this, uh, this important trail system going east, west across and through Toronto. So, you know, I think, you know, if, if a new name were to arise that wanted to acknowledge indigenous presence, why not acknowledge the fact that Dundas, the contemporary street is actually, you know, an indigenous trail. Uh, you know, an Anishinaabe trail, uh, possibly a Haudenosaunee trail, possibly a Wendat trail. So, uh, or maybe it could acknowledge and uh, talk about some of the lands that uh, that Dundas crosses. You know, the savannas, the hunting grounds, the the rivers. Um, you know, uh, the ancient shoreline. You know, uh, the the original Lake Ontario back thirteen thousand years ago. Uh, so there's so many possibilities for renaming, and all it takes is, I think, just thinking about you know, uh, these, these alternative geographies, these indigenous geographies. Thank you. Was there any other questions or is that, is that it? Oh, there was one about, um, cause you were talking about pine savannas, but people sort of think of them as being oak savannas. So did it mm -hmm. kind of switch over or did it, was that human intervention or what happened there? Oh yeah, so I may not have made that very clear. So some of the savannas in what is now Toronto, uh, to Toronto, right? Um, were oak savannas, black oak savannas, and High Park was definitely a black oak savanna. But a lot of the other savannas were actually pine savannas. So uh, they're called either oak savannas or pine savannas, depending on what the pr predominant tree species is. So uh, it's just literally, you know, in these other places, pines were more prominent than oaks. So yeah, so uh, the Deer Park Rosedale Savannah in uh, in the middle of the map there uh, was a pine savanna. The Beaches Savannah was a pine savanna, and I think the one that is now at Rouge, the one that used to be at Rouge Park, was now Rouge Park, was also a pine savanna. So I think that um, it's the High Park Savannah that's the that is the only Black Oak Savannah in Toronto, and it's interesting because of course it's the only one that is still has parts of it surviving as it was. Uh, as, as Black Oak Savannah. All the other savannas have overgrown or um, have been urbanized, they've been developed over, so they don't exist in that way anymore. But in High Park, you can kind of still see what the land would have looked like if you can project these pockets of savanna outward as far as the eye could see in all directions. That's it, good. I mean, no, go ahead and speak. That's it for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, in pointing to the contemporary uh, population uh, community of Indigenous Toronto, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I've shared a lot of history here. Um, but these are these are these are stories which are not simply 
just uh, past oriented stories. These are stories that um, constitute a larger understanding of uh, what, I, what, what a lot of people are calling indigenous geographies, systems of land-based uh, relationships that are not just past oriented, but are also um, feeding into, informing, inspiring, uh, or activating um, all kinds of really important projects by contemporary uh, Indigenous and to some extent also non-Indigenous peoples in the city that are aimed at sort of uh, honoring or coming back into relationship uh, or activating these geographies. So I wanted to just end my presentation today by just talking a little bit about some of those projects. It's not a comp comprehensive list because if it was, I think uh, we would be here all day. Um, the, the, what's been going on in Toronto today in relationship to these sorts of Indigenous geographies is um, expansive. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of uh, great work. So just take this as a very short list of some things that are resonant to me that I'm involved with or that are just on my radar <laughs> and not comprehensive. Okay. So uh, Ogima Mikina. Is, uh, is an important project that goes back for many years uh, now, um, which is a project that was, uh, in, uh, was created by uh, Susan Blight and Hayden King, two Anishinaabe artist activists and uh, academics um, around uh, renaming, giving voice to indigenous geographies and histories and stories in Toronto that rest in the landscape through street renaming. So my understanding of how this project started was through a really ingenious idea of, of, of creating um, magnetic signs that you could overlay on top of the existing uh, colonial metal signs. Uh, and, and, but these signs were in Anishinaabemowin and they would voice Anishinaabemowin terms uh, uh, for you know, the landscapes, the lands that these streets are on. So I think, I think the first one that was done in this project, uh, and apologies if I'm wrong on this, but I think the very first sign that was done, uh, or at least one of the very first signs that was done was at the uh, interface between Davenport Road and um, Spadina, Ishpadina. So where Spadina goes up and it meets Davenport Road, and then Davenport Road goes like that, at that intersection, they put uh, uh, Ishpadina over top of Spadina and um, I think it uh, probably prompted a lot of people, it prompted a lot of conversation. I think a lot of people were shocked. They probably did a double take on their uh, morning commute going along Davenport Road. Um, just thinking about the fact that yes, this is Anishinaabe territory and there are stories, there are all other geographies of this place that uh, are important to acknowledge um, that were targeted for erasure in a very deliberate way a systematic campaign by uh, you know uh, early colonists, people like um, John Grief Simcoe, who you know was well known for trying to erase as many indigenous place names as he could, as a way of I think um, erasing indigenous relationships to landscapes, right, in order to legitimize a colonial or a settler claim to these lands. So so since then the project has has grown exponentially and there's so many places now that are uh, that are engaged in the work of renaming and I think other projects are renaming that were inspired by this original project so this this project which is uh, an Anishinaabe moment term Ogima means leader and Mikana means trail so a leader's trail it really was a leader in a lot of ways and it is continues to be a leader for prompting conversations around these uh, indigenous geographies in urban areas like Toronto so that's that's where to me, it seems like a lot of these, you know, one of the one of the reasons why a lot of these conversations around renaming it are happening today. It's places like Jarvis and, you know, Indian Road, you know, uh, Russell Street. Russell's named after a, a former slave owner and an anti-abolitionist, as well as Dundas. So people are talking about, you know, how do we want to acknowledge this city's past, and who do we want to acknowledge as, uh, you know, as important or significant or memorable people in the city. Um, and a lot of people are thinking about uh, bringing back uh, or bringing to conversation indigenous names, indigenous terms, um, which speak to these geographies, you know, these uh, systems of land-based relations. Um, so any number of these streets could be renamed um, uh, in the future because there's conversations going on about them right now. 
for instance, uh, uh, Lower Jarvis, it used to be called Lower Jarvis, maybe on some maps it still is, but I believe it was officially renamed uh, Warrior's Way uh, in sort of relationship with uh, conversations with Indigenous community around that. Uh, so uh, I put the link down there on the bottom of the slide if you want to check out Ogama Mikina as a really important ongoing uh, project, uh, an intervention into the colonial narrative of the city. Uh, which really gives voice to these geographies, you know, indigenous geographies. Um, this is an initiative that kind of, this, this is a city initiative. It's not really an indigenous initiative, but it's a significant one that I think um, it was informed by um, uh, one of the tours that we did uh, through First Story back in the day, because there was um, the city back in 2016 initiated a new city plan based on the acknowledgement that um, the recognition that the downtown core, which is sort of, you can see in that little map there, uh, circled by all that green, that inner part was projected to double within the next 20 to 25 years in population. So they were seeing a situation that the, the city was growing in a way that was outpacing the existing infrastructure. So they wanted to initiate a new vision or plan for Toronto. Uh, so the, T, the TO core team, uh, initiated consultations uh, back in 2016 about what the what the city could look like in 20 years. So what, how do we envision or re envision the city? And they actually uh, got in touch with us um, through First Story about doing a tour, a bus tour. So we, uh, but they only wanted to do a bus tour of the core <laughs> where they were interested in. So we actually did a custom tour where we led them around uh, and through the areas of that of that map, and we kind of traced um, the periphery. We kind of traced, you know, along Davenport Road and then along the Don River to the east there. And then we went along the lake shore to the west and we stopped and we talked about the islands and the, the importance of those islands historically as well as in the present. And then we went up, uh, you know, Bathurst and, and beyond and then back uh, to our starting point. Um, and I remember uh, it was uh, me and it was um, uh, Brian McLean and it was uh, John Bocage and uh, Ed Sackany. And we were all doing different parts of the tour. And I remember along the tour, uh, the, the planners were just really like kind of in awe, really interested. They were really excitedly talking to each other about, you know, the route that we were taking and, and about how the route that we were taking was sort of lying in the conjunction of so many urban parks and about how there was so much indigenous history and presence and, and geography to talk about through these parks. So that uh, tour, I believe, uh, if I could, uh, if I could interpret correctly, made its way into the contemporary now approved TO Corps plan for the future of the city. So in 25 years, they want to re um, configure the downtown core to make room for this expanding population, but also to, to, to make significant uh, room for urban parks and uh, these kinds of storytelling elements. So indigenous geographies have become part of the official TO core plan for the next 25 years. It's, and these stories are gonna be told or, or, or made visible through signage and other interpretive elements uh, throughout this park, which is a ring that will go around the uh, entire uh, outside of the, the downtown core. So I just, um, you can read more about it in the downtown parks and public round plan that's available on the city of Toronto website. But um, this is what they've said in the report. Historically, the natural landscape features that form the core circle, that ring of parks that you see there, were used by indigenous peoples as village sites, traveling routes and hunting and gathering lands. They're regarded as sacred landscapes and places for spiritual renewal. The core circle seeks to reestablish our connection to these landscapes taking an ecological approach. The core circle challenges us to push boundaries and explore the types of landscapes we can achieve in a 21st century city, including landscapes that enhance the resilience of our city and those that contribute to reconciliation, re reconciliation with indigenous communities. It provides space for restoring indigenous identity, social structure and kinship with land. So uh, that's part of the future of the city. So, um, you know, that's kind of why I like to talk about these stories as contributing to uh, Indigenous geographies, which are not just past oriented. They're not just stories of the past. They're not left there. They're stories that inform how we understand our present and how we understand our future. 
And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is um, the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle. And that just uh, is another initiative that I've become involved with uh, that started back uh, as early as 2019 with a group of Indigenous community members and other leaders uh, in the community uh, around reestablishing connection to the, the savannas in Toronto, particularly in High Park, um, and, and engaging and uh, allowing for creating space within the city's management plan for Indigenous leadership and stewardship of these lands. Because if we acknowledge, um, as we must, that these, are, uh, these savannas are Indigenous ecologies, they were created by Indigenous peoples, it was Indigenous vision that led to their um, presence, their ongoing maintenance, and that it was only with the removal of Indigenous peoples, the forced removal of Indigenous peoples from the lands where the, 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 the savannah started to decline, then it makes perfect sense that Indigenous people should be uh, involved, not, not just in you know, uh, participant roles, but as, uh, as leaders, as managers of these environments. So the circle's work is about trying to create space within the city uh, to um, allow Indigenous peoples who have knowledges about earthwork and in particular, um, Savannah stewardship to take on once again, leadership roles in these uh, in, the, in the park and other uh, related savanna lands. Uh, so there's a little blur from the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle on the slide. Uh, a group of Indigenous elders and community leaders coming together to form an advisory circle to begin discussions with the city about Indigenous engagement in oak savanna restoration. This group imagines a future where Indigenous people take leadership in land stewardship around the city so they can restore their relations, pass on their teachings, and engage in ceremony to heal the lands. And so the link is there too if you're interested in more in the work of this group. Um, but uh, the discussions are going on uh, with the city right now about uh, making this uh, vision a reality. So I just wanted to end by saying um, once again that these are stories about the past in some ways, but they're also stories uh, that coalesce into a, a, a vision of a, an Indigenous geography, a system of land-based relationships that's very much resonant amongst in, uh, Indigenous and, non, and some non-Indigenous peoples in the city today in ways that are activating and creating all kinds of possibilities for um, re-envisioning a, a plan for Toronto that engages actively with uh, Indigenous land-based relationships, knowledge, uh, community, and leadership. Um, so I'll end there and, uh, and say thank you and uh, open it up for questions for the last 10 minutes if anyone has any. Thank you, John. I, I thought that was great, especially in the importance of place names and the importance of language um, and all of that. And also the, the ecological knowledge that you actually have to know. See, most people don't think that I actually have to know ecological knowledge in order to understand history and how that matters sort of in the contemporary um, contemporary context. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that um, that next week is Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. And what are the kind of things that people could do on their own being physically distanced yet yet learn? Um, could they use the first story app? Could they like, what, mm -hmm. what are some suggestions that you can think of for people like I feel like I should like ride my bike along all these trails or try to walk 20 <laughs> or something right on like yeah. just to sort of like connect and you know celebrate in a time where things don't seem very celebratory but um because you know normally there would be a lot of events in the city right but they're they're that's not going to happen so what kind of things can people do yeah. you know by themselves or maybe with one or two people that are safe to do this with do you have yeah some I mean yeah, absolutely. Certainly what you mentioned, uh, getting out onto the land in these places uh, in relationship with some of these um, uh, knowledges uh, about what these lands represent, you know, trying to peel back for yourself some of these colonial layers to make room for other, other possibilities for what this land is about, a, a, a much older vision, which of course is gaining uh, resonance uh, increasingly in the present and into the future. Um, letting that in, you know, uh, letting letting those stories sit with you a little bit. I think I think developing really meaningful um, embodied relationships with place is kind of like the most important precondition for uh, protecting places. You know, like people don't protect places that they don't have relationships with. They're much more apt to exploit them, 
Um, so, so getting out there and having a relationship with place is really important. Having a relationship, learning uh, on your own um, with the plethora of resources that are now out there online um, about these geographies, about these stories, about uh, these perspectives, um, so that you understand, you know, you do the work, whether you're an Indigenous or a non-Indigenous, but in particular, if you're a non-Indigenous person, to do the work of informing yourself about what these lands are, so that um, you're equipped to, to participate in discussions. And that's the second thing, right? Is that there's all kinds of really important discussions that are going on that are, are, are um, in relationship with um, coming to terms with, you know, anti-Black racism, uh, violence, colonialism, um, you know, murdered and missing Indigenous women. All of these things are ongoing. Um, they haven't disappeared with COVID. In some cases, they've gotten worse. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work and responsibility for non-Indigenous peoples to, to be able to take, uh, to do the work of sort of educating um, their family members, their community members about these things so that there's um, enough momentum um, for, uh, for, for, what do you call it? Um, enough momentum for, for change to happen, you know, and the direction of that change can be, uh, uh, led by, you know, Indigenous peoples can be led by, you know, um, Black peoples who are sort of engaging in these struggles, um, you know, putting out fires, you know, literally one, uh, one after the other. They do not have a lot of time to do the work that is required to make these visions uh, a reality. So I think like during this, this month in particular, but all throughout the year, you know, getting in touch with those histories, uh, getting into relationship with them, educating yourself and committing to in your own way, there's so many different ways of doing it to uh, furthering these conversations, uh, creating the momentum that can lead to the change that uh, you want to see. I'm thinking like walk along Dundas and imagine that it's not Dundas and something else. Like what do you imagine that it could be, yeah. that it could be named, that that might be a way of, of everything that's going on right now and how they're all intertwined and it, it's, it sounds like a horrible thing to say, but it's almost like an opportunity to envision a completely different future. And then we can all oh. put our energy into, you know, a different constructive, positive future because status quo and going back to normal is not a good thing because normal yeah. was not was not acceptable already, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, going back to normal is not uh, a reality that I think a lot of us feel like is the uh, appropriate course is to establish an, is the appropriate things to establish a new normal and to envision what that could be by taking a very serious look at what are the conditions, what are the, the decisions, uh, what are the governance practices that got us here? <laughs> and, you know, how do we avoid these kinds of things in the future? So, um, yes, absolutely. Uh, walking along Dundas and Mississauga is great in particular. Oh, uh, Gracie just got me some some food <laughs> thank you there was um, just one more quick question because it, yeah uh, because you'll be eating soon um and it was do you know of any other this is from toronto urban growers do you know of any other work in this region where black and indigenous communities are working together um ah uh, hmm let me might think. be just um, emerging at the moment too right yeah. well yeah certainly i mean um there are certainly uh there is certainly work that's going on in conversations that are being had um, in these movements, you know, that are thinking about, of course, the, the coalescent histories of marginalization and oppression that are common to both black and indigenous folks um, and coalition building uh, in various ways. I can't think of any uh, large scale projects to this stage, but certainly the conversations are happening um, and uh, they need to continue. Um, you know, uh, there's a history there of, as well of indigenous and black relationality going back to the Underground Railroad as well. Uh, and these are stories that have not really been told uh, sufficiently as well. There's more work to be done in that area. So, so definitely there, there are histories in Ontario very close to where we all live that, that speak to that, to speak to those relationships. So yeah, they're there. I think, um... I was, I was just sorry I had to turn away I was looking at my computer because of things have come across and I just signed something uh, for black and indigenous uh, solidarity so I think what we'll do is I'll try to pull them together and then we could put them out on the IEJ website if people are interested in that so they can access that and engage in those um, in those conversations so we, we have uh, 
a couple of a minutes left. So I'd wanted to thank you first for engaging. It's like perfect timing. Um, next week, we don't have any events because we wanted like, like this, because we wanted people to kind of get out there and like do stuff, be out there uh, in the world. Um, next, uh, sorry, um, on Thursday, we have Sylvia Plain at 3.30. Um, talking about canoe building and, and the role of canoe and history. And again, like how we're thinking about history is still being very contemporary and how it actually really matters. And again, this ecological knowledge and, and language being central to really trying to, um, trying to understand. Um, we're also gonna cap off Indigenous History Month on June 30th with Alan Corbier uh, at two o'clock. And he's gonna talk about Anishinaabek history, narratives, archives, and um, museum collections and uh, and you'll get more information on that how you can uh, how you can sign up for that um, you can follow the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project on Twitter Facebook and Instagram um, you can send us stuff on what you're doing next week or on the on the 21st I'll probably be outside as much as I can I think it's calling for a rain but I don't care I'm going to walk the trails and be on the trails and rethink what it was like my ancestors did thousands of years ago um, yeah, so miigwech to, to John for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, to the whole team that makes this possible, Dali, uh, JC, William, Jesse, Kim, Ethan, Amelia, David, they're all, as I always say, I have, they have to manage up, they have to manage me. Um, that's the reality of the situation. So none of this would be possible without all the work that they do, um, do behind the scenes. But John, I really do appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, and, People can find him again. I just do John Johnson, University of Toronto. He's at Woodsworth, and you can find a lot of the other work that he does in the First Story app and the tours. And I think you talked about your starting your virtual yeah. tours, yeah. so people can can learn more um, from John um, over the next little while. So thanks um, so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It was uh, really enjoyable uh, sharing sharing with with everyone and having this conversation. Yeah. Well, have a good rest of the day. So far, depending on where you are, it looks nice. So um, enjoy And thank you everyone for, for joining us and stay tuned for, for other things coming up. And again, in, enjoy next week and the 21st and uh, when Sylvia and Alan come. And thank you, John. You go to everyone. Bye everyone. All right, so this.